unity, because we shared a goal. Ratsum's folk, the companions, and us as well. We all share the same goal. I still remember the days of Operation Rainfall and how we owners in North America were desperately begging Nintendo to bring three RPGs to the West, Pandora's Tower, The Last Story, and Xenoblade Chronicles. And it actually happened much to my surprise. I picked up all three, but it was Xenoblade that truly captured the imagination of fans, including myself. Its legacy paved the way for two sequels, making the Xenoblade series one of the best-selling and most loved RPGs in Nintendo's wheelhouse. So a return to the original experience, only now with remastered graphics, tweaked gameplay, and a brand new epilogue on Switch, makes complete sense. It's a chance for Monolith Soft to make it much more accessible to a new generation, as well as fans looking to revisit an updated classic. But is this version of Xenoblade truly definitive? And is it worth revisiting if you've played it before, even if just for the new future connected content? For those new to Xenoblade Chronicles, it tells the story of two massive titans, the Bionis and the Makanis, who fought for ages in a vast sea. When their clash finally ended in a draw, their bodies became the home to a wide range of races, but the feud between the two never really ended. Now, the residents of the Bionis fight to stay alive from the invasion of the Mechon. This brings to focus a young man named Shulk, who is researching the Monado, a mythical sword that only a select few can control without consequence, yet has the power to easily defeat the Mechon. After an incident involving his hometown, Shulk learns he can use the Monado without issue and even get glimpses of the future. Armed with that knowledge, he sets off across both the Bionis and Mechonis to put an end to the mechanical threat. It's a story that pulls you in with its unique setting and likable characters before unleashing mystery after mystery, and it culminates in one of the most engaging narratives I've ever experienced. There's a richness to the world and how every element is expertly placed before the shocking payoffs. Even upon replaying it, those moments can hit just as hard, especially knowing what the foreshadowing leads to. And in this respect, the Definitive Edition doesn't change anything when it comes to the main game. It's the same story as before, and really, that's for the best. The same could be said of the combat as there are only minor tweaks overall. In Xenoblade Chronicles, the player mainly has to focus on special attacks known as arts, while normal attacks are performed automatically even when moving around. This helps place greater emphasis on a character's position in relation to the enemy they're fighting, as many of the arts can be enhanced if used in a certain position. For example, Shulk's Backslash will inflict much more damage if he's behind the enemy. But one of the weaknesses of this system before was that it was tricky to know which side was which of certain monsters. This is fixed in Definitive Edition by having an art be highlighted if it can be used effectively. So if you're behind the monster, Backslash will now be marked. This also applies to arts that are more effective against certain kinds of monsters, as well as arts that tie into the Break, Topple, and Daze mechanic of combat. These statuses are essential in some fights, as Break opens the monster up to more hits, including Topple, which knocks them off their feet and leaves them vulnerable, while Daze makes them open to attack for even longer. By marking when these arts can be used, it helped me better realize what kind of strategy I should be employing. It's an elegant system that keeps battles fast-paced while employing some real strategy. After all, players can choose which party member to set as leader, leaving the others to their AI. However, if you aren't the one controlling Shulk, for example, he's going to take a while to use the Enchant Art to help the rest of the party effectively damage Mechon, and you'll come across cases like this for many of the allies. It's not that they're bad, it's just that they're not as efficient as the player can be. And Definitive Edition doesn't seem to have improved the AI that much. Still, setting up which of the eight arts they should use changes up tactics and allows players to create a team ready for most situations. It's certainly a more streamlined battle system to wrap your head around in comparison to the rather complex Xenoblade Chronicles 2. Combat is also something players have the choice of engaging with or not in Xenoblade Chronicles. Monsters are constantly roaming the world, but they only attack in certain conditions. Some are based on sight, others sound, making it entirely possible to sneak past many enemies to reach some areas unusually early. Even better, as you grow stronger, the weaker enemies will ignore you entirely, making the difference feel tangible. To top it all off, grinding isn't even a necessity as long as you put some focus on the side quests. 
But it's these same side quests where Xenoblade Chronicles faltered most in its original release. This is an RPG packed to the brim with quests, but actually completing them all could feel like a monumental task as you had to track down specific monsters, people, and items with little guidance. It wasn't impossible, but the sheer number led to a lot of burnout for first-time players, including myself before returning to the game later. It's a shame too, as the quests were a perfect way to quickly and naturally power up your party. Thankfully, Definitive Edition fixes this in a major way. Quest tracking is so much better as each quest goal is marked as a red exclamation on the map. This applies to not only specific monsters that have to be hunted, but people that have to be found or items that need to be gathered. Even the collectible blue drops are marked now, which saves an immense amount of time. In fact, I did every side quest I possibly could from the moment the game started until I reached Gower Plains. What took about 15 hours originally now only took 12. It is a massive improvement that makes the game so much more pleasant to explore. There's a sense of stress that's disappeared, allowing me to take my time and know that I'll eventually reach my goal. This even applies to the unique monsters that only appear at certain times. While it's impossible to change the weather, there is an option to track a specific quest. If it's not the right time, nothing will appear. If it is, a dotted line will appear on the map, guiding players to exactly where the monster is waiting. Considering how huge some of the locations can be, I can't commend the quest tracking enough. But it does raise the question of whether I was naturally exploring the beautiful landscapes of the Bionis or simply following markers on a map. And while there is an aspect of that, the fact that you have to reach the quest givers unaided does create a balance between the two. I firmly believe, overall, this is a change for the better. And it really was the only blemish on the Wii release because everything else holds up remarkably well as each element tied into another. For example, side quests not only reward items, money, and experience, but art points and skill points as well. AP increases the potency of your arts, while SP helps the party learn new latent skills that help in battle. In addition, talking to NPCs for these quests and subsequently completing them increases the party's affinity to each other, which allows them to use skills from those friendly party members or more quickly build up the party gauge in battle. That same party gauge is how fallen party members are revived or, when all three bars are filled, unleash a chain attack where each character in your active party can use an art for free, possibly building to a devastating combo. Completing side quests also builds the affinity of the location the NPCs are based in as tracked by the affinity chart. This will change over time as you meet more people, see their relationships improve, and build support with that community. As it levels up, even more quests are available, which goes a long way in explaining just why there's so much to do in the game. But it never feels overwhelming as each element flows naturally into the next. The time of day is easily changed, fast travel is quick and easy with quicker load times in Definitive Edition, though they're still spread far apart in some of the largest areas. But just the act of exploration can earn rewards. Like all Xenoblade games, the systems are woven smartly together so you always feel like you're accomplishing something. It's not just refined gameplay that Xenoblade Chronicles Definitive Edition boasts, however. There's also the completely new Time Attack. Spread throughout the game are special portals that take you to an alternate plane that can be visited at any time once they're found. There, you can take on challenges to win unique rewards, usually in the form of humorous beachwear. And fortunately, it's possible to wear them at any time thanks to the new option to wear equipment cosmetically and not have it affect your stats. As long as you owned it at some point, you can wear it. So save the world in flippers if you want. Back to the time attack, the challenges come in two forms. Free, which means using whatever party you desire at whatever level, and Restricted, where the game chooses your party and art set. As long as you meet the desired rank, you'll win the prize. It's a completely extra mode since, again, you only win unique beach outfits, but there is fun to be had in taking on the challenges themselves. Speaking of challenge, there are also two new modes in the form of Casual and Expert mode. Casual mode simply lowers the difficulty of battles and will be recommended after a few losses in a row. I never found the game too hard, especially since completing all the side quests will almost certainly overlevel you, but it is a nice option to have for newcomers overwhelmed by all the battle systems in play. Expert mode, on the other hand, doesn't necessarily make the game more difficult, but allows players to decide what level they want to take on the game at. 
It allows players to essentially stock the experience they earn through quests and exploration, meaning the only way to earn XP is through battles. But even then, the levels can be adjusted at will for each individual character. Lowering them will convert the excess experience into a reserve, while raising them pulls from that reserve, meaning players can adjust their difficulty to the level at any time. It's a cool system, but one that will likely only be used by, well, experts. Personally, I didn't find it that necessary for most of the game. It's better for the end game as it's very easy to overpower the final boss if you've done everything in Xenoblade up until that point. Of course, the most obvious change with the Definitive Edition are the graphical upgrades, and they are gorgeous to look at. Each character has been lovingly redone, and although the style isn't exactly the same as before, it's close enough that I barely noticed after only a few hours. More impressive are the locations, which simply pop with color and spectacle with each first visit. It all looks really good, and for the most part, runs well. I did experience a few times where the game slowed a bit, but it was only ever for a few seconds at a time. It's nowhere close to marring the presentation for me. The redone cutscenes can truly convey the spectacle of some of the action, even though the choreography is the same. It's a facelift that works well with only a few cracks at the seams, with certain enemies or NPCs appearing muddy. But with how huge the game is, I was more than satisfied. It may not match the best looking Switch titles, but it gets pretty close. However, just because the models were touched up, that doesn't mean the animations were as well. While some look a little smoother than the original, most look exactly as I remembered them, meaning you can expect some awkward moments of walking, jumping, and climbing. It doesn't detract from the whole for me, but it does serve as a reminder of the game's age. Overall, I'm extremely happy with the upgraded assets, especially the music. Every remastered track is simply gorgeous and heightens the original recording, though you do have the option of listening to the originals instead if you prefer. Personally, I preferred the lush sounds of the new songs, and I never got tired of listening to the soundtrack, even while running around the massive locations. It sets the wonder of exploring these gigantic titans or the intensity of certain battles. Likewise, the voice acting is exactly the same, though the quality sounds a little clearer. Xenoblade Chronicles Definitive Edition is a fantastic remaster all on its own, but that's not even all there is to the package. A brand new epilogue has been included in the form of Future Connected that can be accessed from the main menu at any time without having to unlock it. That being said, I wholeheartedly recommend finishing the main game first if this is your first time playing. It begins by spoiling the ending of the main scenario right off the bat and constantly refers to some of the bigger twists of that story. Without delving into spoilers, Future Connected focuses on the character of Melia as she is joined by Shulk and two new characters to explore the lost region of the Bionis shoulder. And really, this is Melia's story as it focuses on her ideals and ties up loose ends from the main game concerning her. Shulk and the others are mainly there for emotional support, but they do make for an enjoyable quartet thanks to their banter and overall chemistry. Nene in particular is one of the most likable Nopon party members in the series simply because she's more responsible than most. Fans of the Xenoblade series should absolutely view this as an epilogue though, and not as a hint of things to come. It's possible certain loose ends may be tied up in future games, but right now the lingering questions concerning the main antagonist are frustratingly vague. There's no payoff to their presence, it's simply an obstacle Melia must surpass as she comes into her own. And by that metric, Future Connected does its job admirably as it gives certain NPCs a much bigger role in the plot. It helps provide the sense that this is still the same world as you interact with familiar but expanded characters. Speaking of the world, the shoulder is absolutely the star of the show in Future Connected. It is a beautiful landscape that seems tailor-made for the newly improved quest system as many of the areas wrap around each other to create multiple levels to explore. Unlike the main game, it's never immediately apparent where you need to go until you've gotten a better sense of the shoulder's layout. That's not to say exploration is a huge challenge, as tracking a quest will still show you exactly what path to take. But the multiple levels and varied landscapes, ranging from grasslands, plateaus, ruins, and lakes, pulled me in. That said, players should expect gameplay that's mostly the same as the main game. This isn't an overhaul like the Torna DLC for Xenoblade Chronicles 2. The party is set at level 60 at the beginning of the epilogue, with all of their arts available. It's only a matter of customizing them to your playstyle as the two new characters, Nene and Kino, play like the original party members, Ryan and Sharla, respectively. This makes it easy to just pick up and play if you're already familiar with the systems at hand. 
There are a few changes, however. Gems that slot into your weapons and armor are now pulled directly from mining, making it so that, at least early on, you have to work with what you get. It's not a huge deal though, as I soon amassed a collection of gems to match my battle style. Equipment is also a little rarer, and arts manuals, which expand the level of your art abilities, now have to be earned through a special currency from defeating unique monsters. Really, it made the epilogue feel more like a DLC campaign, which isn't necessarily a bad thing. Future Connected just felt oddly disconnected from what I had done before, but that is to be expected when it can be accessed right away. One change I really enjoyed was how it handled quests. There aren't nearly as many as a typical area from the main game, but they felt more meaningful. While they still fall into similar categories like killing certain enemies or collecting a number of items, the way it was presented made all the difference. Many required a lot more exploration or built to unexpected rewards and moments. It's through the side quests that certain characters' stories are resolved or new items on the shoulder are made available. I felt like doing these quests made a tangible difference, which I always appreciate. And one of the biggest of these quests involved the Pond Spectres, a group of 13 explorers spread all over the shoulder. After finding each one and solving their problem, that Pawn Spectre will join your party and help in combat as they specialize in either attacks, debuffing enemies, or healing your allies. It's not a notable difference at first, but as I found more, I could sense an appreciable increase in power. Even better is that once one of each type is found, a Union Strike can be performed, which replaces Chain Attacks in Future Connected. The Union Strike is by far the most distinct change to combat, as rather than choosing from your own arts, you choose what section of the Pawn Spectres will lead the charge. The attack choice damages all enemies in the area, the debuff choice lowers the attack of the target while also damaging them, and the heal choice naturally heals your party. And if the party is fired up, a second option could be selected to carry it on for another round. No matter which option is chosen, three command inputs will appear. The better your timing, the more damage the Union Strike will do. It's a small change, but I did enjoy the simplicity and timing aspect of it. The final new inclusion to Future Connected are the quiet moments spread across the shoulder. Much like the heart-to-hearts of the main game, which builds upon two characters' relationship, this provides a short character interaction scene to watch. However, these are fully voice acted and there are no choices to be made which could raise affinity. The affinity aspect of Xenoblade is dropped here in favor of unlocking quiet moments based on story progress. I found almost all of them fun to watch and a few nearly essential to get the most out of Melia's story. There's no gameplay benefit to watching these, it's all about learning more about the characters, and I believe they truly help round them out. Thankfully, every voice actor returns to reprise their role in the epilogue, even though there aren't that many in the grand scheme. Still, Adam Howden as Shulk and Jenna Coleman as Melia knock it out of the park, even if they do sound noticeably older this time around. I mean, it has been almost 10 years. The new actors fit in nicely as well, and the music is as good as one would expect at this point. The new battle music in particular is fantastic. That said, just because Future Connected is newly developed doesn't mean it looks appreciably different from the main game. It's still using the same engine and runs the same as such. The graphics look great and the characters are certainly on model, with some of the new action scenes really showing off how far Shulk and Melia have come. This also means that the stiff or awkward animations are still there. But again, I didn't find that to be a huge problem in the main game. In all, Future Connected is a relatively sizable inclusion as I completed it in roughly 13 hours, including side quests. But that does lead to the question of whether it's worth buying Definitive Edition only for the Future Connected portion. And while it is fun, it's also a more truncated experience with a satisfying, if not entirely fulfilling narrative. So personally, I don't think it's completely worth it all on its own. Fortunately, that's not really an issue. When looking at all that Xenoblade Chronicles Definitive Edition offers, it's difficult not to fall for these characters and this world all over again. The story holds up beautifully with the remastered graphics and music expertly supporting that original vision. The tweaks and additions only help improve the game and streamline it to help mitigate the burnout that some players feel. And with Future Connected, there's a way to reunite with these characters in a new way. There's something for everyone, and I love the game for that. It's a masterful update that keeps what works and improves what doesn't while keeping the original charm. It's absolutely worth playing for newcomers, and I feel well worth the revisit for veterans when looking at the overall package. Thanks for watching, and be sure to subscribe to Game Explained for more on Xenoblade Chronicles and other things gaming.